Welcome, I'm Howard Nima of We Are Change Connecticut, and this is a Truth Talk News special report, Understanding the New World Order, A Trilogy of Evil, Part 2, The Globalist Interdependence Agenda. Let's think about those people down at Neely's Barbecue going home tonight having heard you. What they've heard you say is the system is really dysfunctioning right now. It's out of control. Nobody's in charge. Hmm. They've heard you express your own worry that in the next three months it could get much, much worse. And they've heard you say that you don't see much good news immediately on the horizon. So let's leave them something to think about as they go home. Let them go home and say, Mr. Soros said, here are three things we can do, simply. One. Well, deal with the, mor with the mortgage problem, reduce uh, uh, foreclosures, uh, recapitalize uh, the banks and uh, and then work on a better world order where we work together to de resolve problems that confront humanity like global warming what sort of a financial deal should Obama be seeking to strike when he travels to China next month no I think this would be the time because you really need to bring China into the creation of a new uh, um, uh, uh, world order, financial world order. Uh, they are kind of reluctant members of the IMF. They play along, but they don't make much of a contribution because it's not their uh, uh, peer reviews effectively is moving in that direction. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. It, it's, it's past the point of talking. Um, we know historically that the global governance um, the sort of agenda um, to these issues is, is, is very hard to try and is, 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 with all the best intentions it's very hard to actually activate. Under the momentum of globalization the world is opening up and at an astonishing speed. Old boundaries of culture, identity, and even nationhood are falling. This nation is right now fighting for its survival, but we are also fighting, fighting for world peace and we are also fighting for future world order. There also exists an extraordinary opportunity to form for the first time in history a truly global society carried by the principle of interdependence. And if we act wisely and with vision, I think we can look back to all this turmoil as the birth pangs of a more creative and better system. That is the position in which we find ourselves today as the most powerful nation on earth, near the peak of our worldwide influence and authority. Indeed, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the discrediting of centrally planned economies, the opportunity for enlightened American leadership is perhaps even greater than it was in 1939 at the beginning of the Second World War or in 1945 when the Cold War began. But this persistent window and this present window of opportunity during which a truly peaceful and interdependent world order might be built will not be here for open for too long. Already there are powerful forces at work that threaten to destroy all of our hopes and efforts to erect an enduring structure of global cooperation. Let me say very clearly that we are not focused, as some have suggested, on establishing a new world order, but rather bringing order to a new world. I think the big question is whether they have the capacity uh, to, to, con to construct a conceptual framework for American policy uh, for the years ahead. Uh, we, do, we have lacked such a framework. Uh, over the last few years since the, since the Berlin Wall collapsed. The consensus we had, the understanding we had about what, what our purpose of what our role in the world should be, what the underlying tenets of American foreign policy obviously have disappeared, and no one yet has been able to come up with a, a, a coherent framework. George Bush tried, 
Do you remember just after the uh, war against, well, during the during the conflict with Saddam Hussein, which he handled so superbly in, in a short-term sense, but he kept talking about a new world order. Uh, and, and and then President Bush, at the end of, the, of that war, promised he would give four graduation addresses, four commencement addresses, describing that new world order and what America's role was going to be in it. It turned out he gave one of those addresses and canceled the other three and talked about something else. That's what, because they weren't ready yet to define that new framework. And that same, we've had that same absence of a framework during the Clinton administration. The decade of the 1990s was meant to have been one in which a new international order, free of the bipolar rivalry of earlier days, was to have been established. on this question of sovereignty. It's very difficult for a large country to accept that somebody is going to come in, like the United States or like the Europeans, and is basically going to come in and say, you're not doing your regulation in a proper way. Fair game. But what's going to happen when China and India are economies as powerful as the United States or Europe? And what's going to happen when there's a mortgage meltdown in India? What's going to happen when a Chinese hedge fund goes under? And that the results of that tsunami don't stop at the Chinese or the Indian border, but that in fact you find them in Idaho and Iowa and California. Who's going to deal with that? Unless we're prepared to understand that in fact we're all going to have to give up a little bit of our sovereignty in order to make the world work. We Americans are going to have to yield up some of our sovereignty. That's going to be, to many, a bitter pill. Pat Robertson has written in a book a few years ago that we should have a world government, but only when the Messiah arrives. <laughs> he wrote, and literally, any attempt to achieve world order before that time must be the work of the devil. Well, join me. I'm, I'm glad to sit here at the right hand of Satan. <laughs> Let us hear the peal of a new international liberty bell that calls us all to the creation of a system of enforceable world law in which the universal desire for peace can place its hope and its prayers. Thank you. The truth is that territorial boundaries now expressing the limits of nation states is losing relevance with every passing year you really are being thrown into a world which is globalizing which is decentralizing disaggregating and compacting as well in the end it is only through worldwide dialogue and governance we can treat the roots of terrorism and really weaken terrorist movements by addressing the issue of development and cultural diversity. Yes, indeed, we need a global answer to the threats of terrorism. And I strongly believe India will be a central actor in the new world order. To what extent do you think that today's outcome and the fact that this was a meeting of not just the big, rich, powerful countries, but the developing countries, is a signpost to the future for a new, um, let's say, a new world order, for want of a better term, that, that, um, that represents a shift in, in power? In the opening part of my uh, formal intervention in the uh, summit today, I said broadly as follows. But this was an important decision by the United States to bring together for the first time a gathering of developed and developing economies to formally participate for the first time in the decision making of the future uh, direction of the global financial system and the global economy. This is the first occasion on which this has formally occurred and therefore it is a point of historical significance. All major contributors to the global economy must be on the decision making bus. What was fascinating today is that countries and economies and uh, societies diverse as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the People's Republic of China, the Republic of Indonesia, uh, Japan, the French Republic, ourselves, all acting
into a common set of problems, all acting uh, on the basis of uh, the common solutions which we must now embrace. And there was, I believe, a common sense across that great diversity of the depth of the challenge we face and the fact that the path to recovery is going to be difficult, uh, bumpy and hard, but there is no alternative course of action other than for us to act internationally and cooperatively. The days of unilateral national action to in one fell swoop solve a global economic problem have been dispensed with. This summit reflects that fact. The time has come for the world to move in a new direction. We must embrace a new era of engagement based on mutual interest and mutual respect. And our work must begin now. And the president outlined his vision of a new world order in which the U.S. would participate fully. Uh, president Obama, I think it's important because it's fundamental that Europe and the United States para não apenas para defender os interesses dos europeus e dos norte-americanos, mas para uma ordem mundial mais justa. If ever there were a time to act in a spirit of renewed multilateralism, a moment to create a United Nations of genuine collective action, it is now. Now is our time, a time to put the United back into the United Nations, united in purpose, united in action. Ele aponta para a necessidade de construir uma nova ordem internacional sustentável, multilateral, menos assimétrica, livre de hegemonismos e dotada de instituições democráticas. Esse mundo novo é o um imperativo político e moral. The answer, I think, is to configure and operate the G20 as the hub of a networked global governance through outreach to other governments, business, civil society, and think tank. So public-private partnerships are another uh, part of this global governance landscape, which again isn't, isn't even captured by those who believe that the G20 is, is, is flexible enough in architecture. So these layers and modes of governance are an integral part of what complete the global governance puzzle, I believe, in the, in the 21st century. And so actually the challenge before us is to build a global regulatory system. This is not properly understood. Are you optimistic a global system can happen it, from what it, we've heard so far? It, it, it could happen and in fact it's in the works. Stay tuned for the final segment of Understanding the New World Order, a trilogy of evil titled Mechanisms of the World Order.